Hello everyone and welcome back to the Belgian Beer Brothers channel. I'm still Cedric here in Antwerp and hey, today is Boxing Day so Merry Christmas to all of you. I hope you enjoyed your Christmas Eve. Um, I know I said that I would take a one day sabbatical but I still have some Christmas beers so yeah, no time like the present, right? Today we are gonna talk about uh, a rather special beer and it's a beer that has a lot of history and also the side that it's brewed on has a lot of history but it also has a very long gap so it won't be that long of a story um, we are going to talk about the Cambron Xmas or the Christmas beer from Abbey de Cambron uh, the no longer existing Abbey of Cambron but we'll get into that in a second because um, This brewery, or the site that this beer is brewed on, dates back to 1148, so yeah, nearly 900 years ago. Back then, the Our Lady of Cambron Abbey uh, was founded as a Sister Sienzer monastery. And that will come back uh, when we talk about Trappist, because the Sister Sienzer order is the order that brews Trappist, and those monks are the Trappists. So that monastery was founded in 1148 as a daughter abbey of the Clairvaux or a, a monastery of the Clairvaux Abbey and apparently this monastery really thrived because it was uh, very successful and so successful that they actually spread out and started other abbeys and monasteries. Now I'm not going to tell you the whole story about the abbeys and the monasteries but Brewing on this site dates back, as far as I could find in writing, to 1677. So again, about 350 years ago. They had an on-site brew house, just like many monasteries had a brew house and a, and a farm. So they had an on-site brew house and it was provided by uh, with water by the nearby St. Bernard Spring. Um, also that name will come back later in the story. Now in 1783 something really uh, yeah, weird happened because Emperor Joseph II actually classified the Cambron as a useless abbey. And yeah they it just ceased, ceased to exist. So 1783 he ruled that they were useless and they were no longer part of the community and it took until 1789 so about six years to finalize that decision but in 1789 the 58 residing monks had to flee to the Netherlands and they actually had to flee. Uh, yeah, <coughs> They were kicked out of their own monastery Upon their return, only one year later, they found that the complete abbey and monastery were robbed of its furniture and of uh, anything useful that was in there. And they actually stayed there for a, a little while, but in 1797 the story really ended indefinitely. So the monks that yeah, kind of got back spread out to the Netherlands and to France to other abbeys. Then a few years later in 1803 the Count of Beaulieu bought the site and he actually wanted to, to use it as a residence so he built a huge castle upon there. And of course that might explain why they were ruled as a useless abbey because it was a 70 hectare uh, estate that the emperor then could sell off. So, so the Count of Beaulieu and his family uh, build a castle on it and use it as their residence and it stays in their family until I believe 1993 when the Dome family buys the site. Now in 1982 the site already got uh, classified as heritage but the Dome family buys it in 1993 and repurposes uh, it to a yeah a wildlife park, an animal park uh, called Paradiso at the time 
and currently people will know it as Perry Daiza, uh, which is still partially owned, I believe about 60% by the Dom family and about 2.5% by Mark Koeke, who also owns uh, a great part of Durbuy and he's a billionaire, so he owns a lot. Uh, but yeah, he owns more places that make beer. So currently it is a wildlife park and reserve and they have over 7,000 animals of about 700 species. But what I find uh, yeah, remarkable and also important is that they kept many of the remains intact and they incorporated the old facades and the old walls and, and all those things uh, into the decorum. So when you actually visit the Peridaisa farm, that's a, hundred, a centuries old farm. Uh, also the, the meter and a half thick walls from the castle are still there. Um, the brewery was actually rebuilt inside the park. So they built a new microbrewery, but they, uh, they actually used uh, materials that, that are true to that time. So they used uh, natural slate, handmade terracotta bricks, uh, all those things. They put in beautiful copper kettles. I believe I still have a, a photo somewhere because I visited them two years ago. I'll put it up here somewhere. Um, and they are a microbrewery that is actually built upon the ruins of the original brewery. So they used the, ru uh, the, the ruins, the remains of the old brew house as an outline to build the new brew house and, and tap, uh, tap room. And it turned out beautifully actually. So if you have the time and then the chance, go visit it. Um, and I don't know the story behind this, but in the 70s, the Cambron beer already has been brewed again uh, by Brasserie de Silly. Now, I have no idea how it ended up there. I couldn't find any paperwork on that. But I do know that the Campon and the, the, the Dome family took it back. And since 2013, it is brewed in-house in the Paradise Brew Hall uh, with the help of Brasserie du Buisson that we know of the bush beers amongst others. And the cool thing is that they because the, the estate has been in one family for 600 years and then in another family for yeah, a few decades, uh, a lot has been preserved and they still use a ancestral recipe and it is said that they still have the original yeast strains. Now, I have no idea whether those are so special or that's uh, a common yeast strain that they used to use back then. Now, of course, we do know that in the uh, 1600s, we didn't know much about yeast so i don't know how much of that is storytelling and selling and marketing and how much is just truthful anywho today i have not the blonde not the dark and not the cherry but i have the cambron xmas again with a beautiful simple label uh, almost parchment paper with the beautiful stag here and some uh, some snowflakes. Now this beer is of course like any um, Christmas beer or winter beer, a strong dark ale that is uh, mostly brewed with some extra herbs and spices, often uh, added caramel or sugars. Um, in this case they use chocolate and special bee malts, so not chocolate but chocolate malt, uh, phoenix and mandarina hops, it is a 9% ABV and they use some undisclosed spices. Uh, I don't know what they are either, but oftentimes we'll have to look in the corner where uh, we find things like cinnamon, things like star anise, things like licorice, uh, like wood, things like that. Of course, we have to bear in mind that these beers are historically brewed in a dark and moody period where people could use a little extra, a little higher ABV to warm up, uh, to get through these cold days. Uh, we, we're talking about times without central heating with one central stove in the, in the middle of the house. So people 
crank a higher ABV and they had something that tasted a bit stronger so this also goes very well or most winter ales go very well with uh, strong tasting foods like stews like game and things like that but we're getting ahead of ourselves let's first try this one out this is rather special as well because I said that I visited Paradise two years ago this beer is from that visit that means <coughs> that this is recipe 3 batch November 24th 2020 and the best before date is December 21 we are December 22 so fingers crossed normally these beers age quite well and three four five years aren't an exception so I really really hope that this one actually made the two-year cut Take my glass here now I've had some people remark that I always keep my finger on the the cap when I twist it open um, let's call that experience back when I was a maitre d I opened one bottle and I didn't have my hand on it and it popped uh, someone got that cap on his forehead so since then I always keep one hand or one finger up there Ooh, yeah still a lot of damp comes out beautiful branded cork Abbe de Compo anno 1148 so they love telling that story as well let's put it here for now okay it smells old indeed it mainly smells like alcohol and brown sugar what we call cassonade uh, dark brown sugar unrefined sugar kinike socket and i do get some rather sweet spices in here so maybe more the anise uh, less of the licorice still has a beautiful sparkle in there and a lot of carbon dioxide a huge huge beige head of foam I do get a rather spicy aroma here and it's very yeasty very bready uh, yeah malt and breath and and sugar cheers quite funny it completely doesn't taste as it smells although I do get some breath flavors in the aftertaste but I mainly taste some slightly roasted malts although this isn't a very very dark beer this is more like a dark amber <coughs> more of a reddish brown Ooh, a lot of carbon dioxide now it's rather boozy 
Now, of course, this is a beer of high fermentation. And although initially it doesn't taste like 9% ABV, I do get this boozy mouthfeel, a very, uh, very heavy, full mouthfeel, very woolly. Um, and I do get some hoppy aroma, some bitterness at the back of the throat. So they did that very well. <coughs> But the dominant flavors in this beer are actually the roastiness of the malts, uh, which is also pretty well done. I expected a very sweet Abbey beer, like a, a Lef or a Grimberge. And I actually got a lovely porter-like winter ale. So, very pleasant surprise. Now, I can imagine then that when I drink this beer fresh, it would be sweeter because now, of course, with the fermentation in the bottle, yeah, the yeast had its way and it ate away all the sugars. So that's probably where the boozy aftertaste comes from. Uh, probably this is now no longer a 9% ABV, but yeah, probably a 9.3, 9.4 because despite what people try to tell us, that re-fermentation in the bottle, that doesn't add 3%. <laughs> that just adds a bit of carbon dioxide and a, and a hint of alcohol. Unless, of course, you dump in a whole lot of yeast and sugar and you put it somewhere warm. But no, this is a quite a nice beer. Not the best Christmas beer or the best winter ale that I've ever had. But I think that... Yeah, let's call this uh, an untapped a three and a half. It's a nice beer. It's well made. It's well rounded. Uh, it's not going to be my favorite, but I am very glad that I've tried it. So there we go. I'm going to put a champagne cap on this and put this in the fridge. Probably have some more tomorrow. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another beer, which will probably be the Kompol Christmas. So stay tuned. Cheers, you guys.